Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana. And it's Saturday morning, and our class today is going to be on apples and pears. So uh, the history of apples, I mean, apples were certainly, I would say, before 1960, the number one fruit grown in the U.S. And it has a, a long history, of course. Apples um, are native to Eastern Europe or or Central Asia, if you want to say that. Pears come from pretty much the same area, although there's Asian pears that do come from China originally. Uh, but they're old world fruits. And the advantage that apples have over a lot of fruit is that they store well. Um, even without refrigeration, some of the older varieties that we were used to grow would store for several months. Um, so that you'd have something fresh to eat in the winter without refrigeration. Of course, uh, most of Europe is pretty cold in the winter anyway, so it's, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, also, you know, they said that the early farms and the early homesteads in the United States, everyone had apple trees because in those days, cider was the only thing safe to drink. The, there was no, you know, water districts to make sure your water was clean. Uh, cider was pretty sterile so that you can drink it. Of course, everybody walked around kind of juiced, but uh, uh, at least it was safe to drink. It wouldn't cause stomach upsets when you drank it. So apples had a big role. Now they're not as popular as banana. Apparently bananas nowadays are number one produce but uh, still, so quite good. And what's unusual is that apples uh, and pear trees, too, have a chill requirement. Most apple trees have a chill requirement far higher than we ever get. So most apples do not ever get enough chill uh, to satisfy their needs that way. However, they still produce. They still produce fruit. Pears still produce, too, however... Uh, the problem, we have problems with pears uh, developing large fruit here because their they're ripening season is too early. So, now choosing a site for apples and pears in your garden, uh, certainly more sun, more energy, more fruit. So the more sun you have, the better. Uh, soil wise, they're pretty easy going. So they both like wet soil. They don't need very well aerated soil, so they'll take solid clay. Um, they're happy in that. They're you know, one of the few trees we have that uh, handles clay very, very well, but they do need a lot of water. So I remember back in the mid 90s, the late 90s, I was growing a lot of apple trees and one year, this was probably 97 or 98, all my trees are developing brown tips on the leaves. The whole, all of my apple trees are doing that. I was going, okay, uh, something's going on with the apple trees. And they didn't look good. They weren't operating well. But the next year, we had that uh, incredible year where we had 35 inches of rain. And that year, they looked great. So I said, okay, they just needed a lot more water. So apple trees would like the soil to look wet at all times. So be aware of that. Uh, now, most apple trees, um, because we don't get the chill that they want, will wake up late here. So, you know, if you're in Oregon, apple trees would wake up April, May. Here, they kind of start waking up May, June, most of them. Uh, because we don't have the cold they need, once it gets warm, now this year it's getting warm, it got warm really late. So uh, a lot of the apple trees we see are just now waking up, just now waking up and starting to bloom. But because we don't have the winter they need, they kind of wake up slowly. So the books, will t the literature says that most of the apples that require chill will bloom over, you know, they'll scatter their bloom over about a two month period, sometime between May and July. Whereas if you're in Oregon, 
uh, every apple blooms for two weeks only and they know exactly when they're going to bloom two weeks you know this Fuji apples in bloom two weeks of scale apples bloom so they when the when they to get pollination cross pollinization they need to get the the you know certain varieties next to each other whereas in southern california uh they all kind of bloom for such a long time that uh, any almost any two types will pollinate each other uh, quite well now as far as we know the apples do not require pollination to make the fruit however when you do cross pollinate them that is two different genotypes are are next to each other you get more seeds in the apples and the apples get a better shape so uh, I've grown apples without pollinators. They tend to be a little lopsided, not quite as big. And the reason for that, you open up the apple and you might find only one or two seeds in it. Whereas if they're getting cross pollinated, they'll have a full complement. I think it's five seeds in them. Uh, and the fruit's better shape and better size. So that would be the reason to cross pollinate. But some, you know, some varieties of apples you, you can't find a good pollinator for. Uh, or you don't like the one that's best for it, and you just you still get apples. Okay, so the best way to train apples, so they don't need good soil. They do like a lot of water. Uh, we don't need any compost or planter mix around, although apples and pears, it doesn't seem to hurt them. Most fruit trees do not like compost around their roots. Uh, but apples and pears have a lower requirement of oxygen in the ground, so if the ground stays wet and soggy and boggy, they seem to still be okay. So on apple trees, what we notice is that the tips of all branches make flower buds. So if you uh, leave an apple on its own and the branches do what they normally do, which is head upwards. The only uh, places where they have branch tips are at that end of this branch. So you get flowers right here and that's it. Now, if the branches lay down horizontally like this one is, if you see all these little clusters of leaves down here, these are making short branches. So the horizontal growth, you start getting the short branches growing off the side. So then you get a whole bunch of apples forming here too, not just on the branch tip, but right here also. So on training apples and pears, what most of them say to do is make sure that you get a lot of this horizontal branching on it. You don't want all the branches heading upwards. So it's nice to get the branches to lay out sideways. And you can do that with tying them down, adding weights to them. There are some things called branch spreaders that they, a stick they put like this to hold them out. And they also say that on a young tree, they don't want uh, side branches that are too big. If the side branch grows that's uh, too large compared to the main trunk, they say cut it short, let it regrow. Because sometimes the side branch will take all the energy and it become the main trunk. So on this particular tree, if this was an orchard doing this, they would probably have cut this branch short and this branch short and kept the thinner branches uh, just to make sure that these branches don't take over. Yes. Yeah, as long as they're fairly, yeah, they can. They don't have to be totally horizontal. They can be upwards a little bit, but it's got. It can't be like this. Uh, forty-five is probably too steep. I think they said sixty, sixty to seventy-five is ideal. Okay. Yeah. Now, what one thing to note on on apples is if the branch is laying totally horizontal, it stops growing this way. So you want it. So if you want the branch to get longer, you have to keep it a slight incline so it keeps growing longer. Because if you do this to it, it just totally stops growing. And it starts growing here instead. So uh, yeah, a little bit of an incline is fine, but make sure it's not going straight up. Because you see apples that aren't trained and all the branches are just doing this. They're going 
they're all turning and going upwards again. And, and all that means you're gonna get apples at the tops of each branch, which is not a good place to have them anyway because they're super exposed to the sunlight and they tend to sunburn up there. So it's nice to get them, you know, apples forming inside the tree, lower inside the tree, to prevent that sunburn. So with a lot of our old uh, fruit tree training books didn't tell you a lot of this stuff. I remember the first one I looked at, uh, um, they said, well, in the wintertime, cut your apple tree to an outside bud. So I had a, I had this apple tree. My first tree, fruit tree I ever grew was an apple tree. And, I, and it grew like this. It grew straight up, a couple branches straight up. So I, so the book says, well, cut it to an outside bud. So I, that winter, I cut them to an outside bud, and then I got this. And I tried it for another year, and then a year after that, so I cut it to an outside bud, and they did the same thing. I was, I was spending all these time, all this time spinning my wheels getting these upright branches that wouldn't fruit. Whereas I could have just laid them out, but that book just said, keep cutting to outside bud. Well, I could have done that forever. <laughs> and the tree still went straight up on me. So a uh, waste of a time. I pulled that tree out. I said, well, okay, it wasn't a very good variety anyway, but uh, um, yeah, that technique doesn't always work cutting to an outside bud where the new growth starts going this way but then it just heads straight up again so i wasted uh five years of my life on that particular tree not getting anywhere with it um, now all we do is make sure you lay these down so apples and pears are kind of trained the same way now the other thing that we, we do get in some espaliered apples that are already trained. And it's interesting the way the grower does it. I mean, all these trees are grafted, rootstock, and then they graft the bud on and grow this uh, scion, which is the pear tree you want off the side of the rootstock. And then you train it upwards and train the branches out to grow. On the uh, spaliers we were getting, they trained the rootstock as a single trunk. And then they're grafting six branches of the apple you want onto the side of it, which is kind of cheating. That's one way. I mean, you can take any apple tree or pear tree. They're quite flexible when they're real young and just train the branches sideways, the ones you want, and cut off the rest. Um, you know, even train these to go whichever way you want. And then you cut this and make another tier up here and make an espalier out of it yourself, the whole tree being the right cultivar. But um, there's a grow up in Oregon that saves time just by having a taller rootstock and then branching, grafting six branches onto it. Um, the problem with the ones we get that are done this way is they're only three foot tall here. So each branch, one foot, one foot, this is only one foot off the ground. That's pretty low. Uh, we had another supplier who was actually training the individual trees like this, five foot, three and a half, and uh, uh, two foot off the ground, which was prop more proper spacing on there because one foot off the ground is pretty short, so. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, when you have it growing in a container like this, how would you do that We Well, we can't here at the nursery. We don't have the room. You have to have anchors somewhere outside here. That's what I would need to do with mine at home in the container? Right. You'd have to, you can tie weights on the branches to make them flatten out or tie sticks to them to space them properly. It's nice to know. The nice thing about apples and pears both is they heal their wounds really, really well. 
So you can have an apple tree that's 10 years old, and if you want to start it over again, cut it down, let it regrow. You're not going to damage it much. That's not really what I want. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's nice to train them as early as you can, but think about it, you know, like peaches, we talked about peaches a few weeks ago, and it's nice to train those, but, you know, they only, they're only good, uh, production life is only about 10 years, 12 years. So if you take too many years training them, you're wasting the life of that tree, whereas an apple tree can be productive for over 100 years. So you have plenty of time to train it. You can be patient and, and just, you know, slowly train the tree if you like. So, but it's nice to get it done quickly. So. Now, the problem with, so if you do take a single apple tree and train it this way, the problem is it is still vigorous. This central branch is still real vigorous. Um, so what a lot of, what some people do is, is they'll do this. They will split the tree at, down low and do this to it. And they said that takes the vigor, it splits the trunk, so there's no main trunk anymore. You actually have four main trunks now. It makes it less vigorous uh, so that it's easier to keep them trained into this form. Rather than this, or like this one, it's so strong here that it's hard to keep these branches uh, going. This, the top of it's too strong, so, so they split it up like this. So there's a lot of ways you can train it. The, you know, our grower only offers us this. Now, if you do have a horizontal branch, even these horizontal, now these look like they're pretty stable, but like when we get a spalliers in, what they do a lot is that every bud on here wants to become a trunk again. And they start doing this on you during the year. So what you do with that is don't let them get too long. Um, you can, you know, say just two or three nodes up the stem, just cut it. Just, and then just keep cutting them, cutting them all summer long, cut them. And if you keep cutting it all the way through summer, so this is a bit of work. Spalliers are a bit of work. Uh, if you keep cutting them, then by... When fall starts, they stop trying to grow, and they develop a flower bud at that tip. And this be, then becomes a fruiting spur. But you have to watch that. They keep wanting to make, sometimes they keep wanting to make trunks again. You can see this apple, this pear tree is very well, we haven't trained it, so it's pretty stiff now and upright. It's still developing some spurs along these upright stems. Well, this was the tip of this stem. Now it's growing another tip. But yeah, we don't have enough room in the store to train these out horizontally. Although it's still possible, they're, not, they're, they're still fairly flexible. So when they bloom in fruit, they bloom in clusters. I don't have anything blooming at the moment, so I can't show you that. But they bloom in clusters, so they often form clusters of fruit. You don't want that on apples or pears. So if you have a cluster, like here's a cluster of two that formed. It's nice to pick one of those off. The problem we have is that if you have an uh, apple or pear that hangs on in July and August, um, we have uh, codling moths here. And they do go after the fruit itself. Their favorite place to lay an egg on the fruit is where two fruits touch each other. They have to hide their eggs. If, if they just find a single fruit like this and lay an egg on this, uh, there's plenty of either ladybugs or uh, lace wings or other predatory insects will just find the egg and eat it. 
so that the codling moth has a little chance to get to, uh, for its larvae to survive hatching if it's just laid on us on the surface of the fruit. But if the fruit is touching a leaf or a branch or another fruit, then the codling moth hide, hides the eggs there. So if you have two pairs hanging together, touching each other, you often, you, you'll notice that summer when you pick the pair, there's a hole in each one right where they're touching. And there's a, a larva in each one. Yes. Same with apples. Same with apples. So the first thing to do is make sure there's no clusters on your apple tree. Um, you know, they'll bloom in clusters of up to about nine flowers in a cluster. So you can actually have nine fruits growing together, cut off all but the largest one. Or you, you can check the fruit first to make sure sometimes they have some blemishes on them. Cut those off. Leave the nicest one on there. Commercially, I think they use a chemical that thins the fruit out some, but I, you know, I can't imagine working in an orchard and having to go through thousands of pear and apple trees and thinning them out. Okay, so uh, now the major problem with apples and pears, so they're, they're pretty immune to root diseases, but there's one nasty disease that they do get, uh, um, they can all get them, and that's um, fire blight. It's the main problem with both apples and pears and their relatives, quince. Uh, loquats are also relative. So when they're blooming, um, you have to watch the flowers. So the bees carry fire blight disease. So the way fire blight works, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's kind of ingenious the way fire blight works. But if you have an area of a plant that's got fire blight, a lot of times it'll make a whole branch turn black and kill a whole branch off. Um, in the winter when it's raining and that area gets soaked, and fire blight is a bacterial and a disease, then the fire, fire blighted stem starts exuding this goo that looks like honey. So the bees automatically go and investigate it, touch it. They find out, no, it's not honey. But now they're carrying the spores to that fire blight to the flowers they visit. And that's how it transfers from a dead area on a fire blight stricken branch back to the flowers. So if your neighbor has a lot of ornamental pear trees, like here in Orange, there's a lot of ornamental pear trees on the streets that have fire blight because no one trims off the fire blighted areas and you have an apple or a pear tree in your yard. Uh, you can watch it. I mean, if the flowers get affected by a fire blight, you know, normally the flower the buds are pink, they open white, white petals, and then they dry cream colored or tan colored and then drop off. Well, if there's fire blight in that flower, the petals turn gray or black. And if you see that, you just go in there and rip off that entire cluster of flowers before it gets in, because what fire blight does, like gangrene, it goes into the flower, into the flowering stem, that little spur, and then it starts going down the branch. Uh, a lot of times it'll stop when it hits the major branch and that's it. But on a young tree, it can be your whole tree. You know, if, the, if you have a flower right here and it goes into the main trunk and affects your main trunk, you can lose the entire top of that tree. So back in 96, I had a lot of apple trees that were just two years old. And that year, we really only year I've ever seen fire blight in my garden, we got hit nasty. Now, we noticed that there are some trees that are very resistant to fire blight. And some that are, some apples especially, that are highly susceptible to fire blight. And we know Gala is super susceptible. So 
I was watching my gala tree, all the branches were going black and it was going down real fast. I'm going, okay, the only way I'm gonna save this gala tree is to amputate the whole top of the tree off because it was coming back down really quickly. So I just clipped that tree off at two foot above the graft uh, and it saved its life. And then the rest of that year, it grew back out to the same size. Apple trees can recover real fast from that, but no fruit, of course, on that year, but a fruit the next year. Because Gala is very, very precocious. So, uh, but boy, I, that tree looked like it was dying. Now, some apples are highly resistant to fire blight. Uh, Fuji, Granny Smith, probably the best we've seen. This doesn't get fire blight. or it doesn't affect it very severely. But watch your apple trees. Now there is a, a fungicide that we carry called Garden Foss. And there's other brands across the United States. This is uh, mono and dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid, both potassium and Phosphorus are major fertilizers that the plant needs. In many states, this is registered as a fertilizer rather than a fungicide. In California, they register as a fungicide, but uh, it beefs up. If you spray the, right before they bloom, if you spray the trunk and branches with this, it makes them fight off fire blight very easily. Um, don't know the exact method. I mean, phosphorus is an important molecule in disease control. So apparently if you really amp up the phosphorus levels in the plant sap, that helps it fight off diseases. But um, amazing how well it works. Now most orchards, a lot of orchards would use an antibiotic, which is just much harder for homeowners to get. <clears throat> anyway, so garden foss, one of the few things we use now for coddling moths, uh, a lot of orchards will use spinosad, which is an organic product. You spray it on the developing fruit when they're, say, golf, golf ball size, and every couple of weeks you spray it, uh, and that'll keep the coddling moths out of it if you, if you don't want to thin it out properly. I mean, generally, if you thin them out to one apple per cluster, you're not going to see the coddling moths. However, we noticed that a couple apples over the years, I've grown uh, Johnny Gold and uh, <clears throat> Crispin, which is also known as Mutsu. Those would get the coddling moths no matter what. So what's one thing that um, the University of California research showed for the organic orchards, you know, before they had this spray, this organic spray back in the 80s, they told the organic farms, well, you can grow apples if you cover them, they will not get hit by the coddling moth. And they recommend a number two paper bag. Uh, cut a small slit in the bottom with the uh, exacto knife. Really good sharp box cutter will do it too. And slip the apple through this and then roll up the other end. Let the apple grow inside the bag. And they said that nothing will touch that apple because they can't tell that this is a fruit. So the uh, coddling moths won't hit it. Uh, it's a bit of, you know, that's a bit of a bit of work to cover every half on your tree with the bag, but uh, not too hard to do. Well, um, I guess it keeps falling off. If you just have a slit in here, it kind of holds the bag around the fruit stem. And then they said, roll up the other end. Now, Sunset Magazine, about, yeah, Sunset Magazine, about 20 years ago, ran an article saying, this doesn't allow the fruit to color up very well. They like Ziploc bags better. So they showed, they just put a Ziploc bag over the apple, punched a little hole in the corner in case moisture got into the bag, and did that. And they said the apples, look better, taste better than the ones that were not in the Ziploc bags. So, now I would imagine you wouldn't want that bag out in the sun. It would have to be one of the fruits in the interior where it's shaded more, if it's in a, a clear plastic bag. 
So that's a couple ways to keep the, the codling moths out of your fruit. Pears get it too. Pears and apples both get it. So watch that. Now most apples hang well on the tree. Uh, the one thing you have to know is that pears, especially the European type pears, uh, you've got to pick them green, not green green, but just as they're turning yellow, but they're still really firm. You have to pick them at that point. You can't let them ripen on the tree or else they ripen unevenly. So um, if you, if you know, sometimes at the store you'll get these pears and you let them ripen and they're soft. You take a bite and the inside is all brown and mushy already even though the outside is fine, well, that pear was picked too late. So uh, the inside will ripen too fast if you let the pear ripen on the tree. So you pick it when it's just starting to turn a bit lighter green. You kind of learn after a while when to pick it. Uh, and then let it ripen inside your house at around 70 degrees. Uh, and then it's a perfect pear. They actually say 68. I don't know people keep their house that cool or, you know, putting a you have a um, basement that's the best place to ripen a pear but most of us don't have basements so but 68 degrees is ideal uh, room temperature usually is fine so pick them and let them ripen inside apples you can leave, let them ripen on the tree now if you are cross pollinating any apples they got to be close so they should be within 10 feet or even closer than that. We saw a study they did, uh, UC Davis did, because they used to, used to alternate rows. They used to have a row of galas, a row of Fuji's, a row of galas. And then the farmers were watching the bees and they said, well, they just go to the closest flower. So they would just go down the row of gala trees and not jump to the row of Fuji apple trees. So they had to start putting the trees, alternate the trees going down the row rather than putting them in separate rows. They wouldn't fly the, the 15 foot between rows. They would just, or the eight foot between rows. They would just go between the apple trees themselves. So you got to have them pretty close to pollinate. <clears throat> now, size wise, uh, we do, same with all the other fruit trees. They're finding that these the ideal size for an apple or pear is probably only about five foot wide. If you grow it, you know, into a normal shape we were mentioning earlier, which would be, oh, I didn't even mention that. Okay, so you can train, you know, something like this with the central leader. The way they want you to train them with the central leader is to have a tier of branches every foot up the trunk, each tier being shorter than the lower one. So your tree is about like that. Christmas tree form. Uh, these branches fairly horizontal, spaced about a foot apart. You know, in a circle, maybe four to six branches in that lower tier. So you can see on this tree, it's not perfectly formed. Well, here you've got a tier of about three branches, but it's nice to have more than that. You can take this little branch here and train it backwards to fill that gap. And then another tier here, there's enough branches here. You can turn these like this and maybe this one to fill that size. Then clip this here, make another tier of branches right here. So if they're much wider than five feet across, the sunlight's not getting to the center of this tree. So you start developing an interior where the tree is where there's no fruit growing at all. So it's nice to have them fairly narrow. So a five foot wide, say eight foot tall apple tree, probably get about 50 to 100 fruit off of that. Um, which, you know, in the old days, you'd have a 15 foot wide apple tree and maybe get 300 or 400 400 or 500 apples off that apple tree. Well, what do you do with all those? <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, that's true. Apples do store well. 
but in in the op, you know, the alternative is to plant in that same space six different varieties of apple trees that ripen at different times. So the earliest apple ripens in June, and then the last apples will hang on all the way into March of the next year. So that's uh, that's about eight months of the year you can have apples on your trees if you choose the right varieties. Pears are pretty much summer ripeners. And they'll store in your fridge okay, but uh, um, yeah, their apples are, have the longer harvest period. Any questions on culture? So lots of water and apples. You want to keep that soil you know, generally I tell people you want to keep the soil a foot, moist a foot deep uh, because that's how deep the root system goes. The, I have a book written by uh, Oregon apple orchard people and, or, and they say, well, you can't grow apples unless you have that. You know, in Oregon they get a lot more rain than we do here. And they say they like to keep the soil below apples wet five foot deep. They said they, they perform a lot better if the soil is wet that deep. It would be hard to do here. So. And the only way you can tell your soil is wet a foot deep, if you have a stick thinner than this one, uh, say about the size of your finger, if you can push it in the ground a foot deep where you're watering it, it's moist a foot down. If you can only push it in six inches, it's too dry for an apple tree. If you can push it in three foot deep, that's great, but you're wasting a lot of water. Fertilizer wise, nothing important. Uh, in my own home, I fertilized them the first year I had them. They were already had grown to about the height I wanted. So I just left the dead leaves on the ground, didn't do any really much fertilizing after that. Um, and they still perform just fine. They don't, they don't need a huge amount, it seems. Um, good fertilizer would be, our down to earth fruit tree is a good, a good fertilizer. The uh, Dr. Citrus one has got similar numbers to this. It's also a good one. <clears throat> okay, let's go over some of the the cultivars of apples. So there are a few oddball apples, the Anna being the main oddball apple that we promote. So this one needs very little winter. There's another one that is used to pollinate Anna called Dorset Golden. I remember if Dorset had two T's or one T. So both of those apples, Dorset might need 100, 150 hours of chill. Anna might need 150, 200 hours of chill. They both wake up really early. This one is usually at the end of January and this one is February. It's a little bit different, uh, a few weeks apart on Dorset and Anna, and they pollinate each other. Uh, the problem with Dorset, so Dorset's interesting. Someone spit out a golden delicious seed in the Bahamas, and up comes this tree that fruits in the Bahamas. So that thing needs a little very, well, it doesn't need any chill if it's growing in the Bahamas, but uh, here we know it's operating with about 100 hours, 150 hours of chill. Anna is from Israel. It, it, it blooms in February. It needs very little chill also. The problem we have with Dorset is it ripens in June, which would be fine if you're in uh, Hammett or in Fresno because it's already 89 degrees in June. Here, if it's really cloudy, got no taste. Well, well it's got plenty of taste. It's tart. It's very, very tart. Anna ripens in July. 
and it is one of, I would say it's one of my favorite apples. It's certainly got a real nice flavor, a tender crispy. It's not dissimilar to Honeycrisp, say. Um, the problem with both of these early apples, really poor hang time and really poor shelf life. So the early apples have that problem in that there's one other early apple that we don't carry, but I'll mention it's Einschmier. Can't remember how to spell it. There might be an I in there. Well, I, was, I was told it's pronounced Einschmier. But so these two are pollination partners, but they all ripen early and they have poor shelf life, which means, you know, you can. You can take a Fuji apple and leave it in your counter for two weeks, nothing happens to it. Uh, Anna in two days becomes mushy. So it's got very poor shelf life. And if you let it ripen to where it's totally red, and it will turn totally red, it's already getting very mushy. So it's nice to pick it when it's three quarters red. It's a big apple. I mean, I, I do like the way it looks. It's, it's an apple that size, kind of red, delicious shaped. Um, and quite good flavored, but poor hang time, poor shelf life. The good thing about these is they will outproduce, these three will outproduce any apple we know of. Really, really precocious. Like most apples, especially Fuji, will only make flowers where there is definite a little short branch spur or at the tips of all their long branches. That's the only place they'll make a flower bud. The Anna apple, you, you look at the branch, there's no flower buds there, and they're blooming. They, you know, you see, you look them in the winter, there's no flower buds. And then comes, when they start waking up, they start making flower buds on bare branches. We, we just can't believe it. They'll make a flower bud anywhere that you don't think they're going to make a flower bud. So that thing just loads up with fruit. Plus... They don't fall the seasons all that well, and we'll have a lot of people telling us their Anna apple or their Dorset makes apples any month of the year. And I would have to say that my own Anna apple, yeah, pretty much any month of the year you'll get one or two apples ripening at that time because they don't fall the seasons very tightly. So you get some flowers here and there all the time. So it is a, a quite a popular apple. I don't have any to sell today. I'll have to bring some more in next week. This one got sold. So it is a very popular apple, the Anna. Uh, now they will store decent time if you put them in a Ziploc bag, squeeze it out, Ziploc bag, put in the refrigerator, two months storage. I've done that. You really want to get all the air out of a bag. So one of our farm employees said her mother taught her this. If you want to store apples, you put them in a Ziploc bag. You stick a straw on one end and close it. And you suck all the air out with the straw and then finish closing the bag. Without oxygen in there, they don't ripen. Now, most storage facilities at supermarkets, warehouses, they put carbon dioxide in the storage bin, which is the opposite of oxygen, so it doesn't allow them to ripen. Okay, so that's the early apples. Uh, the later apples, so you have um, Gala, which is August. I think we have one Gala apple on our nursery left. I'll get some more. Um, then you have Jana Gold, which is late August through September. A lot of people tell me that's their favorite apple. Jonathan crossed Golden Delicious. Big apples. Um, it's interesting. The in Orange County, the best quality seems to be near the coast. For the okay, so what they say um, apples like is they don't like to be above 90 degrees too much for the. What, the last month before you harvest them. If it's too hot right before you harvest them, the quality's not there. 
So on, on Donegal and Gala, if you live near the coast, these are really good because the coast doesn't overheat. So they're a little better near the coast than they are inland. Then you have Fuji apple. That's September, I would say late September through October. And they'll hang on a long time. We have, we have a few red Fujis also in the 15 gallon. Now the interesting thing is most people like red apples better than the green verse. So the original Fuji, which I have more of, is more green than red, and then the red Fuji is more red than green. Well, red Fuji wins the taste test because of its visual appeal. The connoisseurs say, well, if you close your eyes and you eat a green Fuji, it actually has a little better flavor than a red Fuji. Um, they, the Washington apple whatever you call their organization that promotes apples, uh, wanted to tell consumers back in the 70s or 80s how to tell which red delicious apple at the store tasted the best. So when they started doing taste testing on red delicious apples, they said, well, the greenest one tastes better than the red ones. And they decided, well, people like red though, so we won't publish that study. <laughs> So I decided not to say it, but, but they said they did notice that the greener the red delicious apple was, the better the flavor. So, so they do say that the green, the original Fuji apples, which are greener, taste better than the red ones, but people prefer the red ones at the supermarkets. All the red ones sell the better. So there is a roll gala that's redder than the original gala too. Anyway, Fuji, September, October. We have something out there called Pink Pearl. Which was developed uh, over 100 years ago by Etter up in Northern California. He developed an apple with, with uh, pink flesh. So it is a little unnerving. You bite in this thing and it's bright pink inside uh, it's it ripens uh, around the same time uh, early fall I would say it's more of a novelty than anything else it's okay tasting it's not the greatest apple you'll ever eat it's fine um, my daughter just got a hold of an apple tree with that's supposed to have bright red flesh so we'll see how we go with that one locally. It should do fine. Uh, it was, that one was developed in England, the one with bright red flesh. Yes? Hmm. Well, that'd be interesting to have. Now, there, we carry something called uh, Arkansas black, but it's just a dark red, kind of a burgundy red. Wow. <laughs> That'd be a little unnerving. <laughs> oh, now you're going to have us start hunting. <laughs> okay, so pink pearl. Um, there's a bunch of apples that ripen really late <clears throat> and probably more for a climate. So in Dave Wilson's book they have the ripening periods for central california and a lot of these apples that i'll mention ripen earlier but here they all ripen late because they wake up late and those would be um brayburn uh granny smith so granny smith if you're in oregon you pick it in uh october here, we usually wait till November, December to pick it. Um, the thing about Oregon is that because they have the chill, they wake up a little earlier, but they also have those real long summer days. 
Whereas our summer days, you know, 14, 15 hours max. Whereas in Oregon, it's going to be more like 17, 18 hours max. Because they're getting closer to the Arctic Circle there. I would imagine Washington, the days are even closer to, you know, close to 20 hours perhaps in the summertime. I mean, Granny Smith and then uh, Pink Lady. Sundowner. Arkansas Black. And uh, Wine Sap. I'm out of a lot of these unusual named ones. Wine Sap and Arkansas Black, I think, are sold out. Sundowner, which I think is about as good an apple as we can grow here. Uh, we're sold out during, well, they didn't send us enough. We ordered about 60 of them, and we got 10. So from Dave Wilson, which is a huge supplier, they must have had an orchard going in that needed those apples, so I didn't get, uh, I didn't get them. But I think Sundowner is a little better than Pink Lady. Well, in Australia, that's the thought. In Australia, Pink Lady is called Crips Pink. Sundowner is called Crips Red, Mr. Crips down in uh, um, Perth develop these two apples and Perth is the same climate as LA <clears throat> so uh, Pink Lady and Sundowner have done real well for us here now what's interesting Granny Smith is also from Australia but it's from Sydney and if you've ever visited Sydney it's not unlike Mazatlan Mexico it's hot and humid so it's real interesting that Granny Smith you know, it's labeled at like 700, 800 hours of chill, <clears throat> but Sydney has no chill. They said the Granny Smith apples there grow right alongside pineapples. So, uh, so apples do not need chill. I mean, we, we first learned about this back in the 80s. We saw an article <clears throat> that was published through the California Rare Fruit Growers magazine talking about growing apples in the Philippines. And in the Philippines, they grow them on their mountains. And they said the temperature in their mountains ranges from about 58 to, say, 80 degrees. <clears throat> and that's where they grow their apples. So they get no chill. Uh, and they were growing Rome Beauties, which are labeled at 1,000 hours of chill. So they said all they do is, uh, after the apples are ripe, they wait a couple weeks, and then they strip the foliage off. So if the foliage is not there and they've got mature branches with, with growth buds on them, the trees want to refoliate. When it's warm, there's no leaves, they need to refoliate. And to do that, their flower buds open up. So two weeks after they denude the, fold, the branches, the flower, they bloom again, make another crop. So they said they can manipulate any time they want a crop. They just take off the foliage and they start blooming. Again, you need mature foliage, not new growth. But if the foliage has matured, um, like even some of these leaves are fairly mature growth now down in here. <clears throat> they can just strip all those leaves off and it'll induce them to bloom again. Now, a lot of our customers see that they will not water their apples, or especially apple pears, you get by with less water. But apples like it wet. Sometimes if they don't water their apple trees enough in the heat of the summer, the leaves dry up and fall off. And then they get a bloom and they get a second crop. Um, the problem on most apples is it takes the crop about five, six months to ripen. And if, if you get that drought chalk in August and they start making apples in September, it gets too cool to develop them. So they only get about that big. But they still taste like apples. They still taste fine. They're just small because it got too cool for that second crop. Whereas Anna, um, it's, it might start the second crop in July. You got plenty of time uh, to, to get that crop developed. And though they, again, they won't be quite as big as that first crop, but they'll be a good size apple with good flavor around November if you strip them after their first crop. <clears throat> Brayburn is from New Zealand. 
uh, Fuji's from Japan, of course. Gallus from New Zealand. So they're growing apples all around the world. Unfortunately, we tried Honey Crisp for 10 years. So Honey Crisp apparently needs like maybe 2,000 hours of chill because they developed it for Minnesota. So uh, it needs a lot of chill. So here, when we grew it, it was waking up in July. Now, it still made apples. It still bloomed in July. The problem is Honey Crisp ripens in August. So it had six weeks to make fruit. So the average size of Honeycrisp we're getting off the Honeycrisp trees was about the size, well, smaller than a golf ball. They tasted fine, but that's as big as they got. So if you ask Dave Wilson, because Dave Wilson planted all their apple trees, Dave Wilson Nursery planted all their apple trees in Irvine about a dozen years ago to see what was going on down here, because they kept getting reports that the apples were doing fine so they said in, in that their orchard in Irvine at the field station, the only two apples that didn't get to commercial grade were Honeycrisp and Liberty, unfortunately. Now, 2007, and this year too, we got a lot of chill. And in 2008 it was, our Honeycrisp actually woke up in June instead of July, and we got them up to about the size of uh, between golf ball and apricot size. And that's the biggest we ever saw. So we go, okay, it's, it's not going to work here very well. But they work in Riverside. So Riverside gets a little more chill than we do here. They might get 500 hours. And apparently that's enough for the get the Honeycrisp to wake up in time. So uh, they said, so un unfortunately, Orange County, maybe L.A., probably the two counties in, in Southern California that don't get enough chill. Even San Diego County, they got... A lot of those mountains along the coast or hills along the coast, the interior of San Diego County seems to be a lot cooler than Orange County, LA County, because we get too much ocean breeze here. Yes. <clears throat> what did it tell me about? They do fine. Uh, I got. I thought I got some in this year, but I, they, they didn't come. But I've grown them. They do ripen early, so you a lot of the uh, like Gravenstein and Pippin are late summer, early fall apples. So I've grown them, um, they do fine. They're kind of smallish. You know, the fruit's only about this big. So a lot of the old, you know, like Gravenstein, I think was Thomas Jefferson's favorite apple. In my yard, they only grow this big and they ripen in September. They're good, they're good. So yeah, so pretty much all the apples grow. This year we brought in, you know, a few oddballs, but they sold out real fast. We'll have to do more of that in the future because, again, all pretty much all apples do well here except for uh, Honeycrisp and Liberty, which we liked. Now Honeycrisp has a lot of offspring that are coming up. Um, Sweet Tart from New York. We're hoping we'll do well here. And there's another one from the state of Washington that's an offspring of Honeycrisp. So we hope that those will be available. So you, there's a lot of apples in the store we can't get a hold of, Opal, um, Jazz, because they give the farms exclusivity for at least a decade or more. They want the farmers, they tell the farmers, this is a great apple. Uh, we'll give you the rights that only, you know, so homeowners can't, I don't know, it's like not like homeowners can take over the market or anything, but they don't allow homeowners to have those apples for as long as they can hold them off. So we haven't seen, you know, um, there's a few that we really like that we haven't seen at all available to us. Is, is Red Delicious a sort of commercial brand? No, it's a regular cultivar. I've grown it. It ripens in August, September, which is you know, right in the middle of summer, which um, seems a little odd for an apple, but for Red Delicious especially, but they were fine. Although, you know, it can get really hot when they ripen, and that can kind of ruin them, kind of make them taste uh, a bit cooked. But I was surprised. I had it in my yard, and it did just fine.
all, all apples are self-fertile, but they, they're a little better shape and size if they're cross-pollinated with a different variety. Yeah, we, we, well, they have to bloom at the same time, but most, so we mentioned earlier that most of the regular apples, these down here, their bloom will overlap because they don't have a specific blooming period like they do where they get chill. So the, most of these will wake up around end of May and then bloom for a couple of months sporadically on their branches. You know, the whole tree doesn't bloom at once like it would if it had the proper chill. So all these can overlap pretty well. Now, we, we know that they say John Gold is self-sterile, needs a pollinator. I don't know. Uh, in my house, sometimes John Gold no blooms around and still makes fruit. So it does seem that all apples are will make fruit without a pollinator. Even if they say they're self-sterile, they'll still make fruit. Just probably a little better fruit if they have a pollinator. So... Well, it's better if all of them get pollinated, but again, we, uh, apples are apparently, uh, what do you call it, semi self fertile. Yeah. They spoke about well, that's the one we brought in this year that's supposed to be really, really good. I, I have no clue. I don't, I've never eaten it, so I don't know that one, but I heard that's one of the best. So, in. All right, because uh, in Dave Wilson's catalog, they have the biggest paragraph describing apples on Ashmead's kernel, so they must really like it. Well, that's not true. Golden Russet has a little more literature written about it than Ashmead's kernel. Widely, so Ashmead's kernel, they say, widely regarded as one of the all-time best flavored apples. The question is, of course, is it going to be like that here? It's going to be the best flavored apple in Southern California, and will it do it next year? Because if you got an ash meets kernel from us this year, it had 500 hours of chill in Fresno before we got it. So uh, we'll wake up in time because estimated hours is 800 to 1,000. But it says here, proven very productive in trial with much less than estimated chill hours. So it's no, we sold out way too fast. So I, I don't have one. <laughs> we can wait till next year. <laughs> I mean, I mean, apples, there are more varieties of apples that Dave Wilson grows than any of their fruit in their catalog. So it's like, boy, there's just too many apples to try. I mean, there's got to be uh, over 100 apples on their list of apples that they grow. Hmm. Okay, let's talk about the pears. So, I mean, with the apples, you know, you get an Anna apple in that group. That's, uh, well, Anna actually starts ripening late June. So, late June all the way, and Granny Smith will hang on until March. That really hangs on a long time. Oh, I didn't mention uh, Granny Smith. So if you pick it in November, so my neighbor had a Granny Smith apple that hung over my side of the fence. He'd pick all his apples in November to make pies out of them. I just left them on the tree until January, February. Once you get past Christmas, uh, Granny Smith starts changing to a yellow apple that's super fragrant and very sweet. Doesn't ever lose its crispness. I'm wondering if in, in Australia that's the way it is because they don't have any winter there. Maybe it is just a yellow sweet apple there. And when they brought to uh, the United States, it became a green tart apple. But if you leave Granny Smith on the tree, especially till January, the fragrance is so strong off the apples. I remember getting out in my car in my driveway and I could smell the Granny Smith that were 60 foot back along the side of the house. Just a real fragrant apple. It is quite different than the other apple trees, so it's more susceptible to mildew. So 
perhaps not too good along the coast, although it doesn't seem to ever hurt the tree that badly, but they get this white mildew on the new growth a lot. Um, totally resistant to fire blight. They do think that um, Granny Smith is a, has some French crab in it. They said that the lady who found it uh, down in Australia was growing French crab apples near other apples and this seedling came out of their um, compost pile and that was the Granny Smith apple. Because it's a, when you feel the apple, even when you feel them at the store, they're kind of greasy. They said that that was a uh, um, characteristic of the French crab, very greasy feeling apple. <clears throat> okay, so pears. Um, the true European pears do not do well here. So European, they make fruit, but they ripen too early. So, uh, and they bloom too late. So I remember my father grew, um, oh, what's a common pear? Bartlett for nine years. And he got pears pretty much every year. They were like that big. Because I think they're again, they bloom late, ripen early, like the Honeycrisp apples. So, uh, and I tried growing Kamas pear, which some books said did fine in, in Southern California. Um, I grew them for 20 years. I got one good fruit off of that Kamas pear. So we, we kind of given up on all the European pears. We just can't get them to fruit. Then there's the Asian pears. Now the main Asian pears we grow are the Japanese pears. Um, this year we're offering Hosui and 20th century. Now last year, Hosui did really well. We were just so pleased with that because Japanese pears, we hadn't, we hadn't, I, I grew them back in the 80s when we had real cold winters and they all did quite well for a few years there. And then we lost those really cold winters where we actually had frost every night and they didn't, weren't doing as well. So we kind of quit carrying them for 20, 30 years. And some of our customers started telling us that their Japanese pears were doing well. So we carried them, so we're carrying them again. And last year, we kept the Hosui tree around last year. That had a really good crop. Um, that's this one here. And Hosui is the top rated Japanese pear eating wise. And I would agree, it's really, really good. Now, people are used to European pears or European people don't like this one as much as they would like a European style pear like this. Kiefer pear is more European styled pear. Um, it's got the nice, well, it's got a pear shape and then it ripens real soft and, and juicy and sweet. Whereas Asian pears are crispy, not quite as, you know, Asian people like to say not quite as slimy sweet as the European pears. It's more of a clean sweet. I don't know Asian people don't like super sweet fruit. So I find this pear to be outstanding, just incredibly good. But most of my Europe, you know, Caucasian poise would rather have a European counterpart. So, um, so it's up to your taste. Now we're a little confused because last year we got a great crop on this tree. This year we're not seeing any fruit forming. Even though we had a colder winter. Last year the difference was it was hot in February and even hotter in April. This year, no heat. So I'm not sure what's going on there. If it needs heat to get the blooms out, but they leafed out fairly early, just no flower buds. So we're not sure what exactly happened on that. Hopefully it'll fruit next year for us. But uh, this is an incredibly good pear, as far as I'm concerned, the best pear we can grow here. Now, European type pears, we cannot grow, but there's hybrids. So,
So when they hybridized Japanese and European pears, they got some offspring with lower chill requirements, uh, but the half Japanese, half European pears, none of them turned out to be all that good. So they took those crosses and recrossed them with uh, European pears to get a more European type pear. And our best performer in that is kefir. And that's this one. Seems to be making fruit all by itself. There was nothing blooming around it when it was setting its crop. Now, I haven't eaten this one yet. Well, that's not true. I ate this one back in the 80s before I was much of a fruit connoisseur. And I said, well, it's okay. Um, but I haven't eaten one since. So if I eat one, you know, I'll try to keep this around. We'll see if we can uh, get the fruit off of this one to try it again with the more refined taste if I, if I still think is this an okay one. Dave Wilson says it's the best pair for Southern California coastal areas. So now we've had other ones in the past. We had hood, which I think is actually a little lower chill than kefir, but uh, fruit quality is just okay. So I kind of, I'm trying kefir now instead of hood. My hood made hundreds of pears. I didn't eat too many of them. There's, there is a hybrid we have out there called, well, there's a couple, couple new ones, and the new ones seem to be pretty good. So there's, a, there's one called Tenosui. And there's one called Southern King. Both develop in Texas, I believe, by the same breeder. And what they are is they took a pair called Tennessee, which is European, and they took Hosui and crossed them. And they got Tennessee, and then they didn't they couldn't figure out another neat name. You know, they could have said, say, Ho Hosi or something like that for another, but they named the other one Southern King. Uh, both of these last year the Tennessee had a great crop on it. It was right next to the Hosui. Both bloomed at the same time. Both made a big crop. Um, again, my Caucasian boys like the Tenosui. I like the Hosui. This year, no, uh, not much fruit on the Tenosui either. But Tenosui and Southern King are, are, we've seen the Southern King fruit, although people kept buying the tree, so I didn't get to taste it. So these two seem to be quite a good uh, European style pair, but we'll have to see what the quality of Southern King is. But the Tennessee was definitely more like a European pair also. So, so we have Kiefer, Tennessee, Southern King, 20th Century, and Hosui in stock right now. I think only have one Southern King left, <clears throat> but quite a few Tennessees. Pears are more susceptible to fire blight than apples, so you have to watch them. So a Donju is a European pear. Right. And that? I haven't tried it. Yeah, I think the chill on those is quite considered quite high, or they ripen, I don't know, they... Eight hundred hours pollinated by Bartlett. So they ripen late summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there aren't any low chill European pears. They're not some kind of hybrid. We've grown Monterey We've grown Orient. They weren't all that great either. I did have one though that was quite good. Whoop. Let's see if they have the name in here. So back in the 80s, I was growing all kinds of stuff. Um, it was somebody's name, but I don't, Dave Wilson didn't sell it. And that one did well in my yard, but I couldn't find a source for those trees anymore. Nah. 
They don't care. Okay, any questions today? Yes. They don't care. They don't care. So pears, you can have the worst soil in the world. It can be solid clay, rock. They're not, it's not a big deal. Sand. Pear trees are very forgiving. Apples and pears both very forgiving on soil quality. If you put them in compost, it doesn't seem to kill them. You know, that'll kill, a, wipe out a persimmon tree in a, in a week. But it doesn't seem to hurt the pear trees. They're not that, well, we would just say uh, almost any fertilizer works. A good one that we carry would be the down-to-earth fruit tree. We like the numbers on it, 624, lots of calcium for, so, okay, so apples and pears both have a, one more physiological problem called um, bitter pit. I'm not sure why hitting my forehead makes me think better, but... <laughs> But bitter pit is a lack of calcium in the fruit. In um, a lot of big fruited things get it. Um, tomatoes get blossom end rot, which is the same thing. And um, sometimes um, cucumbers get this hardened area. That's a lack of calcium. In the fruit itself. Now, young pear and apple trees sometimes just aren't able to get the calcium up, and sometimes because their stems are so skinny, they're not holding enough calcium. There's a lot of calcium in wood. So as the, older, as the trees get older, they have more calcium, and then they can put more calcium in the fruit, preventing the bitter, bitter pits or when you eat an apple and you get this hard brown spot in the flesh. Sometimes it appears on the surface too. Same with pears. You get this hardened area of the flesh. It's not a disease, it's the lack of calcium in there. So we have calcium sprays that you actually spray on the developing fruit itself. So you spray the spritz the fruit with the calcium and it gets the calcium levels up. You just if you put it in the ground, sometimes if the tree's young, it still can't pull it up and put it in the fruit. But as the trees mature, that, that bitter pit tends to go away. Now, one other thing, this is the first year we've seen apple scab in, gosh, almost 30 years since we saw apple scab last. So apple scab is like, I don't know if you know what black spot on roses look like. It's kind of a fuzzy black spot on the leaf. Um, and it happens when it rains on apple leaves. Well, apples usually wake up so late and it stops raining that we have no problem. Well, this year... It started, it was kept raining when the apples were leafed out. So we actually saw a few um, spots of apple scab for the first time since 95. Uh, there are fungicides that treat apple scab. This garden foss would do that too. I don't think you'll ever see apple scab on, on your fruit trees. The end apple wake, uh, wakes up early enough that the leaves get hit by the rain. The other apple trees wake up so late on us that I don't think We've never seen a scab on them, but on the Anna, we've seen it in 95 when we saw it this year. I think we must have sold the one. If scab gets bad enough in the orchards, it can transfer to the fruit and cause scabbing on the fruit skin, which is not good commercially. That would be an unsellable apple. Yes? Would you be shaping pears the same way as apples? Pretty much the same way. Yeah, pear trees even are stronger being straight up than apples are. So yeah, if you get them more horizontal, they'll make a lot more fruit than if they're all grown like this. So, I mean, if you have a pear tree with two trunks, you can work with that. You know, you don't have to make all the branches go sideways, but make sure that there's a lot of horizontal branching and then you get a lot more production on those branches. Yeah, okay, I brought one in. So they, 
Yeah, so they do make multi-grafted apple trees. And the problem is, is they don't all wake up at the same time. So the ones that wake up earlier, like this Anna, uh, apple on this side, and the Dorset actually wakes up first. Um, this one here, which is Gordon, wakes up late. And I think they initially put a Fuji on here too, and that thing just failed. I think this was a Fuji graft. Yeah, because they wake up too late, so they're right. So if you got apples like that, then you put the ones that wake up earlier on the north side of this tree, so the ones on the south side get more access to light because these will just shade out the other ones. So that's the problem. Um, so we we're not a big fan of multi-grafted trees, um, just because usually the ones you want are the ones that don't make it. So what they do with all these apple trees is they graft about five different types of apples on each tree, and they'll tell us that three of them took, but they don't tell us which three took. So, and it's usually not the ones that we wanted. Gordon and Dorset are not two apples that I like. The Anna's okay, but I'd rather have the Fuji and a Gala on here or something other than, than what they sent us. So that's the problem when they have these multi-grafted trees. Uh, I actually ordered the more northern climate apples because I like all those. This is a, was a low chill apple selection. But I'm not, again, I'm not a fan of Dorset or Gordon. Gordon was found in Whittier. Okay. All right. Thank you.